Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Patrick, and everyone for coming. Um, as you guys know, uh, the Stoa is a digital campfire where we dialogue about the things that are happening that are most important in these interesting times. Uh, you guys know the drill. You guys have been here over and over again. Um, Pat Ryan has, I've seen his slides for this uh, presentation, and it's going to, I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, you guys know how it works. Um, keep try to keep track of like Pat's amazing voodoo magic and uh, have some questions for the Q&A after the session. Uh, Pat, he has a talent for explicating the, the algorithms of the core of civilization and power. And is, I, I love it and I'm excited for this session. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to Pat. Pat. Thank you very much for the introduction. I mean, I'm enjoying the, the new MCs. It adds a different vibe every time. This is nice. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back for another session of Dark Stoa Season 2. This one will be talking about demon hunting, as in how to do it, as in most of you are actually demon hunters already. You just hadn't had that explained to you yet. The fact that you've been sitting through this session means I've been slowly trying to tease out uh, who is receptive and who is not. So let's just get into it then. Oh, I'll need uh, I'll need sharing permission, please. My nose is itchy. <clears throat> okay, episode five, demon hunting. So let's just get into it. That date's wrong. I can't be trusted with calendars. All right. So season two has been dedicated to exploring the other half of this meme, which is over here. And in this episode, we're just going to do a real quick recap of everything that we've been going through already, just so we can get back on the same page and I can do my seasonal pivot to go into solutions and things that you as individuals can actually embrace about the madness that is continuously spewing out of my mouth. So we're going to talk about, well, we're going to recap what the Blue Church does to all of us and why it's important to, at the very minimum, resist it at the very, well, at the very minimum, comprehend it, and then you can decide what you want to do from there. So let me just get this going. So last episode, we were talking about tabula rasa mythologies, where people continuously insist upon using very bad analogs about the brain, where it went from anywhere to being a sperm tank to a quantum computer, which is quite the gamut when you really get down to it. Um, in the 1600s, things were no different. People thought the brain was a book. That's what tabula rasa means. It means uh, the clearing of the slate or a blank slate. So in this book, you can write whatever you want, uh, which is a way of saying the brain could be anything you train it to. Uh, you, could, uh, you could write it down, anything you want into the human brain book. And you, humans can use that freedom to then free themselves from material and historical chains. That was a very important thing in the 1600s as the beginnings of the Roman Empire were starting to reassert themselves, not just from the papal church position, but from the trade and the maritime trade and maritime insurance as that was accumulating over time. You had newly minted uh, nobles. You had a merchant class that was on the rise. Uh, you had this, this the, the electric shock of freedom in the air all throughout 16, 15 to 1600 Europe. Um, people wanted to get away from the madness. So this book was this, this meme of, or this neuro mythology of tabula rasa really compresses the spirit of that time. Um, and of course we get to peak tabula rasa with the advent of, of this wonderful character, Martin Luther King Jr., who I've had the pleasure of working for his family in the past. Um, their children, unfortunately, do not like each other very much, and they are still arguing about his estate. Um, and right there, in, in his, one of his most famous quotes, you'll see, um, I, I kind of abridged it, but, uh, you know, the children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That's exactly tabula rasa. You are, you are not your history. You are not your form. Whatever is constraining you, you are not that. You are a blank tab. You can write whatever you want. You have the freedom to do so. So you have like peak tabula rasa mythology, neuromythology right here. And so, so far, so good. 
uh, Blue Church might be onto something. This is a, a good thing to to kind of embrace. It's it's all looking good, right? Well, you gotta you gotta follow things all the way to the end to see the problems. So here's what happens when we uh, when we take that tabula rasa uh, mythology and apply it to the individual and see if there's any disconnects. So uh, let's look at where things aren't as free as you suspect they would be. Um, geo, hey, that's a flat Earth. The geo destiny. So not all parts of the Earth are actually the same. Um, the opportunities in the Sahara Desert is nowhere near the opportunities in Manhattan, is nowhere near the opportunities in Antarctica, is nowhere near the opportunities in a mountaintop in Japan. Every part of the world has its own dependency of economics, uh, uh, ecology, um, energy dynamics, political dynamics. Every part of this globe is a mess and everyone is, is, is in this constant flux. So right off the bat, you don't have the freedom to write your destiny on the globe because there are competing forces that will just squish it. So that's, so we have some disparities there. We get the economics. I mean, you know, upper class, middle class, lower class, that's a pretty obvious one. Not, you don't have the freedom to just jump to the ultra elite in a sustaining way. Maybe you might get lucky and get invited to one of their parties if you have some talent or, or aesthetics, but you know, your rent, you're just rented at that point. You're not actually living amongst them as them. Um, so there's, again, you don't have the freedom that's being promoted here, but at the same time, that lack of freedom is what makes that tabula rasa neuromythology so attractive. Um, social networks, some people are more connected than you. That's just, that's just how life goes. Uh, I'm nowhere near as connected as I should be. Um, I probably could put more investment in that. And there's some people in this very chat who are crazy connected. So you, know, it's, you have disparities there. And then technology. I mean, the, the difference between this gear versus the robot hand that's holding it is, is 200 years of, of technological investment. It's pretty significant. And genomics, you know, this is kind of racy, no pun intended, but you know, it's, uh, there's differences here too between people and however, whatever cluster and whatever group you want to come up with, you can always find differences here. I mean, just ask machine learning. <clears throat> and then culture, I mean, there's plenty of differences in culture. I mean, just ask, just look at the internet. I mean, not everyone is an educated upper class, uh, 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 white cosmopolitan. That's just, there's, there's way less of those than there are humans on the internet. So right off the bat, we're seeing the idea that the blank slate, the freedom to write wherever you want and somehow bypass all these domains. Hmm. No, that's not true. You can't. You have to account for each one of these domains. You have to navigate every sentence you write in that blank slate. You have to comport it to all of these domains in order for that sentence you wrote to have the message you intend to have. You can't just like blow through it like a rebellious child and scream and whine and burn stuff down all day long. It's, you're gonna attract these domains to start stomping you out because um, you're, you're, you're fucking up their flow, man. Um, and so these differences, um, there's a lot of differences here and there's a lot of conflict and tension that arises from those differences. So what happens? How do you negotiate those differences? Well, there's different mechanisms. There's you know, trade or price discovery, but the one that people seem to form intuitively and organically across the globe and across time spans uh, is law. Law is that one binding force that brings all these domains into balance eventually in some capacity. Now, I'm not saying it's putting it into balance perfectly. That's not what I'm saying. Law is the attempt to put these disputes in balance in the hopes that you can steer them towards the tabula rasa myth a neuro mythology. So you got the balancing of interests. Um, and it, we're trying to balance someone who has a real big interest in making sure that people have access to water versus someone who wants to be a, a real asshole and say, well, no, you got to pay me more and more for my water. So then there's some balancing of interests here, right? And if you fall on the wrong side of the balance, you get the shooty boys. Now the law says that's fair because, well, I got to bring it into balance. If the, geo, if the geo destiny is not playing along, well, call it the shooty boys. If the cultures aren't, aren't playing nice, bring in the shooty boys. Shooty boys are like the backstop of the law, no matter where you go, right? It's, 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 it's not the gold economy, it's the lead economy. And that's, that's the backstop of everything. So the law does rely on this stuff, no matter where you go, no matter what formulation of law you come up with, force does happen. And our wonderful libertarian friends like to say that 
that the um, that the state has a monopoly on forests. That's a that's a clever way of of stating that you know in the end it's still a lead based economy. And when you and you when you put that lead based economy. Uh, to the individual, well, they also have to regulate themselves. They also have to balance themselves in respect to those different domains. Um, and a lot of those conflicts tend to show up as symbols. And here's what I mean by that. The law is just written words for the most part. The law is trying to solve these situations and these local tensions and these macro tensions, and it's writing them down symbolically and saying, here's the compression, like, here's the compressed conclusion of the conflict that we just went through. So if you come across a very similar conflict, just look at that compression we wrote before. It'll save you a lot of time. It's a really handy technique. And... Uh, then you get the culture, the cultures throw their symbols into it, and then religion throws their symbols into it, and everybody throws symbols into it, and it's just a mess. So now you have like certain symbols represent good laws, certain symbols represent bad laws, people complain about the symbols, and then now the law has to come in and manage the symbols that it all created. And so it starts saying that these symbols are illegal. Like these are the bad symbols, these represent bad neuromyths, and these represent bad cultures and things that we don't like, and blah, blah, blah. And then you have symbols that represent good things. So what does this mean? What is this symbolic management that the law accidentally created by trying to manage the individual? What, what does that actually look like in the real world when it finally emerges? Well, you get the, when you have people using the bad symbols, you get the helicopter ride boys. Uh, and when people are using the good symbols, you get the helicopter cash boys. So this, this, is, the, this is the heliocracy, is the, the helicopter rulers of the world. Uh, and meanwhile, the rest of us, we have no idea. <laughs> this looks downright schizophrenic to most of us. It's like, oh, wait, this symbol is bad, but, but this one's good. And it, you have no idea what symbols you want to use. As of right now, I think 400 federal laws in, Amer in America, 400 federal laws are created every single year. There is a new federal law every single day. Do you subscribe to that RSS feed? <laughs> no, you don't. So you have no idea what laws you're actually under at any given moment. So it's, it's, it's anyone's guess because this game just gets so complicated because all the law has is a symbol. That's the only thing it has. It has shooty boys and symbols. It has to manage both of those. So you, you don't even know if it's safe to like, is it okay to use this symbol? Is, is this symbol? Is this bad? Uh, the best bet is just hide behind the chair and, you know, hope you don't get smacked, which kind of sucks. But a lot of us are here. Like a lot of us are here, whether we know it or not, or where this poor guy is. So what happens when you get impatient with this? What happens when the, the law is not making sense and you're like, is, you wanna say something, right? So here we go, you got the law, you got this poor confused chump, which is like 98% of us. Then this person's also confused, but they're on a schedule. They gotta get stuff done. Like, come on, like seriously, like that doesn't even make sense. Like that law doesn't even make sense. What are you doing? And they say, oh, that's a heretic. That's a heretic, you gotta arrest him, you gotta kill him, you gotta get rid of him. We gotta bring the shooty boys in, get rid of him. Now this person who's just been sitting there waiting to understand what symbol's good and what symbol's bad, they've just been sitting there now they just got a green light. They said, ah, I got the green light. Now I can actually do something with these symbols. And so they go after the heretic. And so it is a self-regulating cycle. The symbol management, it's like a, it's like a life cycle of symbol management. Oh yeah, and if uh, this person retaliates, well, you know, then they'll just justify the law. After all, the law called him a heretic. And when this person retaliates, well, I guess they were a heretic. So this is how, this is what tabula rasa eventually ends up becoming. When you start writing in the book, you are responsible for everything you just wrote. And when you get a hundred pages in the book, ask any creator of any type of story or any type of movie, when they write their Bible of characters, it's very hard to get continuity. It's very hard to say, oh, this character was here at this timeline. So then that means in this page, oh, I got to go back to page 54 and change my timeline. Well, the same thing's true about law. You're trying to write a story about civilization using the language of law, and you are on the hook for all the previous laws you wrote. So getting consistency is really hard. And if you call out that things are inconsistent, well, mm, good luck. So then this leads naturally into identity politics. Now, how is that possible? Well, we have the heliocracy. We have the helicopter ride boys and the helicopter cash boys. And what do they do? Well, you got punishment and reward. And this is what the law is. Now, these are the arms of the law. This is how they modulate 
the human behavior uh, state machine, right? So in this case, uh, we have different identities, which I'm going to represent as hex colors uh, in CSS HTML land. Um, uh, the 000 squad does not like the idea that they are the target of helicopter rides. Um, and meanwhile, the FFF team is uh, pretty happy about all that cash they're, they're somehow getting. But all's not well in tone land or in hue land. Uh, it turns out that EEE doesn't get as much as FFF. And maybe uh, 444 doesn't get beaten as much as 000. So what we have is this fractionalizing of identities. It's not just here and here, there's variations mutating. Now these, these variations didn't mutate on their own. They didn't just set up, we're the 444 club. It's not how it happened. They just didn't get beat as much. So now people who are watching people get beat say, oh, I guess I'm part of this 444 group. Weirdest thing, I'm, I'm only getting beaten twice a week as opposed to seven times a week, right? So that's a, that's a natural distinction people will pick up upon. Same here. EEE looks up at 444 and they're like, I'm, I'm not making the money you're making, what gives? So people notice things. They notice when they're treated differently. We're really good at that sort of thing. And more, diff, you know, more delineation happens. 888, they're like, eh, what is, I don't know what 000 is complaining about. It's not that big of a deal, give me a break. And then CCC is sitting there like, ah, I'm kind of poor, man. This is kind of butt. Where's a helicopter for me, right? So it all starts here, this very simple delineation that the law tries to codify, but then things fragment and you get identities. But they're not actual identities. They're synthetic identities. They're synthetic in relation to the law. They're not actual culture. They're not actually there. They're just manifestations of the law and manifestations of trying to game this heliocracy trying to get the helicopter, uh, helicopter ride guys to go after these guys and get the helicopter cash people to dump on these people. It's, it's, just a comp it's just a game. So identity is now just yet another battle space to play in. It doesn't actually represent um, the reality of the human condition at all. And why, why stick with a gradient? Things can, you know, things can go in a totally different space. This space is pretty simple to understand, but let's go to a place that's harder to understand. A natural variation from the darker hue, a natural variation from the lighter hue. Now we have totally different identities and they're okay. They're being treated okay. Maybe they come from a place where they're really highly educated in all of the type of technologies that are needed. Uh, even though they look like these people, um, they are treated pretty decently despite being accidentally confused for this group, right? Meanwhile, this group of people who are kind of like these groups because they're not, you know, they're in the bright range or in the bright hue, right? Uh, maybe these, this, maybe this particular identity barely survived the civil war and they don't have all the skills that the, that the society that they that they moved to, uh, have. And despite them being of this family, they're not treated the same. So the identity stops following this very simple heuristic of, of one versus the other. And then it starts getting multidimensional and things get weird after that because we're pattern seeking creatures and we're trying to find patterns and all this stuff. And at, once you introduce this level, uh, identity patterns go out the window. You can't actually come up with really simple heuristics anymore. And then, you know, this group doesn't like that group because they're cousins and they're fine because this group's doing all the work for that group. And uh, it turns out that these two people did fight that civil war and their stance on the civil war is, well, you lost the civil war, so fuck off forever. Uh, we in America do that all the time when it comes to the South. So it's really not that alien of a concept. But the point is when you, when you play these identity games, they no longer follow anything that a human being can actually make sense of. In fact, what you end up doing is retroactively justifying all the exceptions um, and you're no longer describing a system. You're just describing the way things are under the guise of creating a system because scientific culture says you should systematize everything even if it doesn't make sense. Uh, meanwhile, you have this, you know, so, so they're all, again, just to reiterate, um, all of these identities do not naturally exist. They do not organically form. They are all driven entirely by trying to game the heliocracy, trying to get the helicopter ride boys to go after their enemies and trying to get the helicopter cash boys to go for their allies. That's it. It's just a posturing game. Meanwhile, someone calls out this posturing game. They think the hex system is lame. This is stupid. This whole game's freaking retarded. Why am I even playing this game? This is, oh, God, post-hexism is terrorism now. Look at that. You have to play the hex game. We have to stick with our identity hexes. Oh, this is sad. So what happens to this poor set? 
well, this is an unauthorized identity. And it's really important to make them an authorized one. Because if we can't make them an authorized one, well, we just got to get rid of them. We have shooty boys. We can make that happen. So now we get all the identities that are under the hex system, and we start steering the identity. We say, all right, we'll take uh, this one. We'll accuse uh, this identity of being a CCCist. And meanwhile, the CCC group will say, ah, we got some funny memes. So what happens? Well, there's a mutation process. It mutates. So now, you know, you're not exactly E8. You're kind of E, but you're more 7 than 8. Subtle mutation. Kind of change, right? We're making our changes here. We're, we're influencing. We're, we're, we're trying to get this person back in the, back in the space. But then the three zeros come in. They got crazy drugs. And FFF is out there saying three zeros are stupid and we don't like that. Well, you know, mutates our, our, our friend, the radical, once again. We're trying to bring him in line. We're trying to expose, you know, the identities who are, are already in line so that we can teach this identity what is expected of it. And then, you know, we get to these guys and they're just cool dudes and this is incoherent yelling. So the obvious solution, who influences who here? Um, then before you know it, you've completed the transmutation chain to get this unauthorized identity to being an authorized one. So that's what happens to the individual. Um, the entire group now hammers that person until they fit within uh, the hex system that is easily understood. So tabula rasa, where I write down the book of every individual, uh, not only are you on the hook for everything that you wrote on that book about your life, uh, you are now expected to look like every other book in the library as well. And so now the law comes in because maybe this person didn't follow the pipeline correctly. And it's like, uh, now this person's an upstart and it's screwing up my color codes and I don't know what to do here. So I'm going to go to the law because I'm trying to get my helicopter ride boys to do stuff. And now I got to get my helicopter cash. But all right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm the law. The only thing I know how to do is make stuff illegal. That's, that's, my, that's, like, that's all I do. I use my symbols to make stuff illegal. So that, these are illegal because there's too much conflict associated with it. And these are good. These are approved by the, by the law, right? And then all we're doing is changing where the ride boys and the cash boys go. We just, we just change the dimension. Meanwhile, our poor, <laughs> is it safe to identity yet? Still hiding behind that chair. So, the, so the, the same game has now moved to a totally different space. And then someone says, this is stupid still. Now they're calling, now they're saying, instead of that little hex saying the hex system is stupid, now someone else comes in and says, this reaction is stupid. So what happens? Oh, we're back here again. Oh, look at that. Here's our, here's our scared person who looks like all of us. And here's this person who's also confused, but you know, they got bills to pay and stuff to do. That law doesn't make sense. You got to banish the triple zeros. Finally, a 00800 light. Eh, if you HTML program, you'll find that funny. So again, we find this triangle once again, reasserting itself as a reaction to the law to make sure that the symbols about the law hold for continuity's sake. And don't you dare retaliate because you'll justify. This person had to be banished because they called out the resolution to the problem. And if they retaliate, you're going to justify the people who, who banished the person to begin with. And around and around we go once again. So where does this take us? This takes us to scientific methodology because now what we're doing is we have our symbols. We've built them all up over time. We're, we figured out how to be continuous between our symbols uh, and we know how to measure identities. So it sounds like we're going to have to bring in science to find some additional efficiencies here. But first, foremost, we got to figure, uh, figure out what is science and what isn't science. So this voodoo shit and this native shit and this sci-fi shit, that ain't science. This guy's science. He's all the science you need. You don't need any more science after. He is a accountable and repeatable and explainable scientific methodology, methodology practitioner. That is science. It's all you need. Science, TM, big science. Everybody loves science. And here comes the law. And by the way, you got to out, out all these other dudes because uh, they're interfering with progress. Uh, th that's his way of saying only my science, no gods before me. And the law, meanwhile, it's the only thing they know how to do. So they're more than happy to get these guys out the table. And they do. They push them out. And so these guys, instead of having a seat at the legal table, they now have a seat at the cultural table where they're spreading natural news articles and Alex Jones memes. So now, because science 
was the good boy. Now, the science and the law are married at the hip. They're very married. They can no longer be separated without, without extremely violent uh, reactions because the science is the only thing that can actually manage what the law did. The law has gotten too complicated and only the science can actually parse it. And furthermore, the law looks to the science and say, well, could you take this complicated cultural mess and make it more predictable? And the science says, sure, we'll come up with financial instruments that mitigate risk, or we'll explain sociology, or we'll come up with psychology, and we'll science everything until we're blue in the face so we can minimize the risk so you, the law, can do more things. And then, because they're married, you know, they do what married couples do. They have pillow talk, and the science has pillow talk and says there's nothing beyond the atom, whispers it ever so delicately into the law's ear. And the law says, oh, oh, right away, dear. Of course, there's nothing beyond the atom. Makes perfect sense. So now we started with the promise of tabula rasa where you could be anything you want. And by applying scientifically guided sociological optimizations mired in endless identity compromises, you end up with the best Tinder has to offer, which is God help all of us. That's better not be our future. He was more than happy to announce it's just a bag of atoms, just from, from God's ear or from God's mouth to, to your ear, right? And that's what happens. We go from all the potential that could exist to uh, you're a robot, pal. And don't you dare disagree with it because this is the robot path and this is the tabula rasa path. And guess what? I'm the law. So uh, these are good and those are illegal. Now, oh, back at this again. Look at that. It's like uh, the helicopter ride boys and the cash boys are at it again. Look at them go. And meanwhile, all this person wants to do is, is it safe to science yet? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, who knows? This turned into a mess. So what we thought was science isn't science. Now it's a legal thing and now you can't make progress in science anymore, imagine that. Oh look, this scene again, just round and round we go. Every time we try to find this Band-Aid, we end up back in this, this, this pattern, this pipeline. So we have, our, we have our, our, our scientific legal complex and this person just can't make sense of why certain things have been rendered illegal. I, uh, well, actually, let me step back a bit here. The thing about science is that it defines what is possible. It has this weird effect where once you're, ex once you're exposed to all the possibilities of science, you say, oh, I can now extrapolate the future. I can extrapolate some assumptions about the future. So for example, uh, if I gave you a robot that can walk, that I could talk to in some capacity and it was able to spit back good enough uh, linguistics at me, I would naturally conclude that maybe in you know, 20 years, that thing's going to be reciting Shakespeare and I'll be having Shakespearean conversations with it. That's the type of um, extrapolation that one would naturally make. And so what science does is it has a monopoly on the horizon, the horizon of what is possible. And so when you start playing these games where you say one thing is good and one thing is bad, you're eliminating certain sciences like genomics because that, that violates tabula rasa and you're accelerating other sciences like computer science because that accelerates surveillance state. So what you're doing is you're, you know, you're picking and choosing your horizon, what type of destiny you want. And so when we get back here and this person's like, wait, why are we in a surveillance state? Whoa, 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 conspiracy theorist, pump the brakes. You need to slow your roll there for a second. Um, this person who just doesn't even understand the conflict, more than happy to attack this person. And round and round we go. This person is just like, what the hell? And again, the, the key here is the law has to look consistent. It has to look justified in every decree it does. So if I call this person a conspiracy theorist and they get pissed and they attack, well, I, I guess they were a conspiracy theorist. Every accusation they make is designed to make sure that the target retaliates to justify the accusation. Circular justification, right? And we've already gone down utilitarianism. So I'll just do a brief summary on this one. And I think we have some new people here. So utilitarianism is the idea of um, maximizing joy and then minimizing suffering. Um, and that's orthogonal. That's not like, you know, pains over here and pleasures over here. You can have pain and pleasure at the same time, or you can have very little pain and very little pleasure at the same time. So it's orthogonal. So you just, you know, a little cross. Um, and uh, much joy, very pleased, small pain, tiny ouch, small joy, join, I didn't fix that, geez, small join, tiny pleased, and very much pain, very ouch, right? So utilitarianism tries to do this, is selecting for a lot of joy and not a lot of pain. And it turns out that that's what the right side of history is to the blue church. 
uh, and everything else is just a, a satanic Nazi. So, you know, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a quick recap. I do have an entire series. If you're confused, uh, I have an entire show about this. If you're confused by this concept, please double back and take a look at it. Um, I'm just going to push on. Um, basically, before I move on, it's, it's, this is a core drive. Once you have the blue church's ability to write all of its laws down symbolically, its ability to uh, go after people who don't handle uh, the identity categories they are predefined to go into to maximize legal optimization. Um, and then they don't comport to the scientific methods ability to then understand and navigate those categories. Um, then at the very minimum, if all that control mechanism fails, then we'll just dump happiness on you. But we're not going to dump actual happiness on you. We're going to dump synthetic happiness on you. We're going to fill you up with drugs. That's it. Because what's the difference? So now you end up being this person. Now, once you start going down the, the, the synthetic happiness route, here's what happens. You start, you start justifying infinite violence. So if you're trying to, uh, this, whole, this whole be happy and maximize happiness, if, if you're not able to achieve it, one, you're going to fake it because everyone else is faking it. And two, uh, even if this doesn't work, they'll just fill you up with chemicals. So, you know, pick a drug of choice. It could be any type of narcotic, could be alcohol, could be any type of vice, have fun at it. And while you're in this state of seeking happiness, Here's all kinds of things that absolutely are not happy and you're going to avoid because it is your job, Mr. Skinner Box, to find the happiness at the end of the maze. Therefore, you're going to avoid these things. So what you're doing is in the pursuit of putting this mask on, you're going to avoid all of the actual disaster that's going on around you. And so this person is just stuck in this trap where they have to seek happiness because everything else is too complicated to fix. But that's not enough. The whole point of utilitarianism is to make sure you're happy, that you are at maximum infinite happiness. And this is not infinite happiness. Your coping, your coping mechanism is not enough. Your coping mechanism is never enough because there's always someone else that's happier than you. And they're very pissed that you're not as happy as they are. And so the pressure to drive you and drive you into this ridiculous state over and over again keeps piling up. And the more they drive you into this happiness, the worse this shit gets to all of us. So now we have science and the law. And now because they're trying to maximize happiness, science can actually create chemical happiness. The law can force the consumption of that chemical happiness. And they can pick and choose. They can pick which one's bad and which one's good. Yeah, Ritalin was good once. Now it's the bad one. Lexapro is the good one. I should be getting paid for ads for this. In fact, I'd be part of the helicopter cash boys if I was. But everyone else, they get the helicopter ride boys. Those are autists. Those are, those are weird people. We don't talk to them anymore, even though we pump them full of drugs. We put them in the insane asylum or we dismiss them, whatever. We'll just keep the churn going. Meanwhile, again, it's us. Is it safe to happy yet? So now even happiness is clouded. The very concept of happiness is clouded. So, the, so these, this, is the, this is what happens when you, when you play the, the tabula rasa neuromythology. You end up where you're trying to write this book about yourself and you are on the hook for all the consequences of that action. And you end up in this road of trying to seek happiness and you can't back out. There's no backward motion in a book. That's the problem about a book. I can't, I can't erase the pen. I can erase the pencil, but, but life is a pen. It's a, it's, a full, it's a forward process. I can't go back in time. So what I write on the page is the page and burning the page sucks because if I burn a page, I got to burn all the pages before it and fix all that too, because it's a pen. What can I do? <sighs> this is all sad stuff. Sorry, folks. So let's, let's change this into some action instead of sitting here listening to me talk about, you know, the end of psychology. And before we do that, just, you know, check in with this cycle real quick. Uh, again, someone looks at why did, why is Lexapro all of a sudden the thing you want to go for? That doesn't even make sense. Well, just dump you with more synthetic happiness. We'll come up with a new one. We'll come up with an opioid. We'll come up with a synthetic opioid. We'll come up with uh, new drugs all over the place all day. Just shut up. That's it. Finally, a green light and, you know, the retaliation threat, the posture, you know, because if, if you're complaining about this, then all they're going to do is hit you with more synthetic happiness. You don't want that because you're already confused about the last round. So you don't want to be tied down and dumped with drugs or have ads for 
for uh, uh, alcohol dumped on you all the time. You know that's coming, so you're not going to do it. <sighs> so this whole, this whole evolution from that neuromythology, what's happening is trying to resist the evolution of a neuromythology is a guaranteed way to get the shit slapped out of you. Because the neuromythology is a powerful, powerful tool. Um, it unifies a lot of people because it rationalizes a lot of things and it gives people a very heuristic understanding of all of the law that they can't even possibly keep up with. So here's a quick example of what happens to you when you resist the power of a neuromyth. Uh, for starters, you'll be looking at reality curiously because we have brains and we're humans and we're very curious. Uh, and then you have to hold a false consensus about reality defensively. So if, you, if you're out there being like, hmm, genes are pretty interesting. And then someone says, what do you mean they're interesting? That sounds like you don't believe in equality. Well, then you have to hold a false consensus and be like, no, 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 I, be I believe in equality. That's fine. That's fine. Even though you secretly have, you know, complaints about it, but you just can't file them. That's all. And then that's not enough. So they're going to actually come after you directly. You know, the cost, you know, you're racist. How dare you believe in genes? Well, then you'll rationalize their assessment as a bargaining strategy. You know, I'm not racist, but it's a bargaining strategy. You've heard that a million times on the internet. It's just bargaining. And that doesn't work because bargaining never works because there's more of them than there are of you. And so you will experience reduced social potential. You will be isolated. You will have your teams taken from you. You will have your family taken from you. You will be removed from social media. Your ability to engage in PayPal will be removed. You will be locked down China style. You will not be able to actually go towards any type of social event in the digital space for sure, which is in turn going to feed into the actual meat space. So you're going to be isolated all because you're challenging a neuromyth. Ask me how I know. Now, because you're isolated and you don't have a support network, now you got neuroses to deal with because you don't even understand why you got isolated to begin with. I just happen to understand why I had to deal with 12 years of being shadow banned. Years with a why. Most people don't even understand that. Technology is too complicated. Social media is too new. They don't get it. So now they have this, like, this neurotic fear of every action they do and they can't understand the penalty that was actually put upon them. So they develop these bad cognitive coping mechanisms as a result. And then that, that in turn results in self-isolation because now they're afraid of everything. They challenge the neuromyth. They are now isolated intentionally from here. They don't know why they were isolated. They're lashing out. They're trying to find empathy. They're trying to find ex explanations, but no one wants to deal with that heretic. No one wants to deal with that scarlet letter. So now the person is actively self-isolating where the priest caste could not actually reach. And of course, this leads naturally to synthetic happiness and you will acclimate because you can't even understand what the fuck happened to you. And this is what, this is what waits for every single person who fights against the neuromyth. Every neuromyth, this will happen to you. But here's finally the good news in this entire mess. The good news is that as you go through this, you will develop skills that no one else will have. You will develop perspectives and ways of looking at the world, and you will find actual people you can rely on when you go through this pipeline. Now, let me flip this around for you. Um, before I do that, this, I always forget this part, forgive me. Um, so we keep, we, every, time, every time we hit this part, we, we hit this, you know, whatever the law and the science come up with as a resolution, someone says that doesn't make sense. That person is clearly a monster from the perspective of science and law. Now we have to defeat the monster because these guys are just huddled in a cave waiting for the green light to actually do something instead of living in fear all the time. So they go to attack the monster, but then the monster activates. You see before in all the other examples, they didn't. But in this time, let's say the monster does activate. Let's say they lash out. They go after the source of the isolation. They don't want to go down that pipeline that I just described in the previous slide. They actually say, fuck that, I'd rather die. All that does is justify the law. That's all it does. Because if someone calls you a monster and you act like a monster, the rest of the world doesn't understand the nuance. They don't know what actually went down and they don't care to know what actually went down. 
if someone calls you a monster and you act like a monster, you will be a monster. And that's it. No nuances allowed. They're not going to, there isn't a journalist who's going to come along and, and give you a nice little puff piece in advance. They're not going to do that. You're fucked, basically. The moment you go active, that's it. So now I can talk about how I can flip this around and turn this into something useful. So the good thing about cognitive dissonance is that while it makes you look like a hypocrite, it actually is training you to manage multiple symbol systems. So you can have different symbols. If we take our scenario where we have all these symbols that have all these different meanings from all these different cultures and all these different laws and all these different psycho histories. If you try to keep track of all this, if uh, it, it will make you seem like inconsistent, you'll be like, ah, oh, well, Christianity is here. And then communism means this. And spatially, if I go two spaces this way and down this way, at least, you know, come up with all these like weird numerology uh, systems to try and make sense of it. But as you explore that, most of, most of your initial attempts are going to fail. You're going to want to follow up and research and understand what all these symbols actually mean and go through them. So you man up. Sorry, that's archaic terminology. Forgive my, forgive my time capsule uh, definition. You, uh, you become a grizzled veteran. When you play this game long enough, because you don't agree with what the blue church has done, and because you have been forced down this road, because you said, bro, this doesn't even make sense, you've been hit by the law, you've been hit by science. You eventually say, okay, well, if I can't be allowed to make sense, of, make sense of symbols, I'm going to make sense of symbols myself. I'm not going to wait for the collective to come down and give it to me. I'm going to actually go ahead and actually do it myself. And so now that symbols, that was this chaotic mess, now you're steering these symbols. Now you're understanding the relations between them all. Now you can read a legal passage and say, oh, this legal passage means this, and this financial contract means this, and this, this outcome actually means this thing. So when the law points to these things and says you're guilty of these, now you can come back and say, no, I'm not. There's entire communities of people who are frequently incarcerated in America. They become extremely good at law afterwards. So much so that if you ever go to an American prison, you go to the law library, you will find nine times out of 10 that the legal books, all the, all the pages are torn out in the law libraries. Why is that? Well, one, the funding for a private prison is pretty high. You'd think they'd be able to replace the books, but obviously they don't want to replace the books. If someone's in prison for 13 years, or you definitely don't want to provide an endless supply of legal books to help them get out of that situation. And what happens is the prisoners will rip the page out and keep it for themselves. And that's what happens. But the point is, as you get pushed down this system, you will learn to manage these complicated symbols. You'll start to understand the history of things. You'll start to understand the relationship between all of these techni techniques and technologies that the law and science uses. Because you don't have a choice. You've been isolated. The isolation process has begun. And so now you're adapting. You're actually being empowered. It's just not being explained to you that way. You see it as isolation. I see it as empowerment. Now we go to our rationalization where they call you a racist. I mean, I'm not a racist, but that type of bargaining strategy that never fucking works ever under any circumstance. You know, here they go. You know, they, they call you that, right? You're that, right? Now, the poor, the poor dam here is sweating. It's a dam. It's, it has water. How, why is it sweating? I don't know why I did that, right? It's sweating. It's, it's like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? This is a, this is a, this is a bad scenario uh, because if I, if I screw up in this scenario, my bargaining strategy fails, and I'm going to be put in the isolation pipeline. All right, well, become an influence operator. Learn how to influence a situation. Learn how to read these people and understand, okay, what game are they playing? Let's flip it around. That's a fun little flip. We can all agree that the guy who killed Hitler was a great man. Wait a second, Hitler killed him. Now, this is an odd thing. This is a strange sentence because on one hand, Hitler is the great evil and he is the grand racist. And killing him is the best thing you could possibly do, right? Wait a minute, who killed him? Oh, he killed himself. Oh, now what we've done here is we've added this state of suspense. You've put them in an uncomfortable position where no matter how they answer, they are now the thing that they are accusing you of. No matter how they answer that. There's no way for them to answer that where they don't look racist themselves. So you become an influence operator. So when you get the isolation, Isolation is a pretty bad thing. Most people don't know how to handle it. And there's plenty of pathways for you in which you can be forced to handle. It's where the drugs and all the other stuff comes in. 
Uh, but these heretics are actually assets because the law didn't just isolate you. It isolated tens of millions of people. And they're assets if you know how to find them. It's a standing fucking army if you know how to find them. So you realize, oh, I'm alone. They isolated me. The law and the science isolated me. But because you're isolated, now you can see the other isolated people. Before you couldn't. You're too busy playing the game. You're too busy trying to protect your social status and, and all the things that mattered. You're trying to prevent the isolation from happening so you couldn't even see the 10 million people that were isolated. But now you can because you're finally in their shoes. Now, if you want to fight against that stuff that sent you down this pathway, well, that's a free army because if you're alone, so are they. So now you have an icebreaker. Now you have something that you can bind on. Now you have a team that you can build from. Now you didn't build this team. You didn't create this out of whole cloth. You're not a grand orator. You're not a grand speaker and your charisma was the thing. The science and the law created this thing. All you did was find it. See, you don't even have to create everything. The law did it for you. Now you know where to look. So isolation becomes an asset. So this is a good thing. Feels like a bad thing, but it's a great thing. It just takes time, that's all. So now you got your neuroses, right? You're down the pipeline. I've been isolated. I'm under attack. I'm hyperventilating. I don't even understand what happened to me. Why am I shadow banned? I, am I shadow banned? I don't know what's going on. You know, you're, you're developing all this, like, you know, mess about your mind. Okay, well... Let's look at what's going on in your thresholds, your sensitivities. Okay, so um, for X and Y, our X is going to be the number of conflicts you resolve, increasing to the right, and symbolic sensitivity, uh, increasing on the up. So symbolic sensitivity means you see a symbol and you think it's reality. So when you, the concept that Tumblr made so profound was I am triggered. What that really means is you see a symbol and you think it's reality. You can't tell the difference between a symbol and reality. So um, if you are here, then all symbols are real. And if you are here, no symbols are real. And as you resolve your conflicts over time, real conflicts, your symbol sensitivity will go down because you will realize the amount of cognitive effort that you have to do to track things that are going on here is so high. But if you're too busy resolving conflicts, then you'll say, fuck it, not all these symbols matter. None of these are real. None of these are actual real threats. They don't matter because you're too busy resolving conflicts. Inversely so, your symbol management skills go up. Because now you're like, oh, I can tell the difference between a symbol and reality. Oh, I'm getting good at this. So now you can deal in more meaningful conflicts instead of like the sporadic conflicts that we do online or the sporadic conflicts we do in our personal lives. You get better at it as you do more of it because congratulations, you have a brain. That is as tabula rasa as you're going to get. That's the writing in your brain that it actually is sticking. So when you combine these two things together, well, you end up like this guy, ready to go. So then uh, they start uh, cutting you out. And first they isolate you from the people they know you're, you're connected to. And then you'll start isolating yourself when you try to reach out and, and get some understanding of the scenario, but they don't have any understanding of it, just like you don't have any understanding of it. You just got hit with the full force of the state and the science. Buddy, you're fucked. You got hit with, like, it's the equivalent of getting hit with Cthulhu. You have no idea what the hell happened to you. And these guys don't know either. So you, get, so you isolate yourself. And so what that means is, while that's, again, a terrible scenario, it's a filter. It's a glorious moment in time to filter who matters and who doesn't. What are the strong connections and what are the weak connections? Because the weak connections are going to say bye-bye. But the strong connections are on the door. And from that, that's that that's an entropic reducing down to immutables. You got hit with all the isolation of that Cthulhu state science law crap. And now the only things that stick are the only things that are meant to stick. And you can rebuild from here. So you are filtering for the resilient and you are discarding the frivolous. Again, this is supposed to be an attack, but it's actually an opportunity. And then we deal with the synthetic happiness. This is a tough one. I, even I struggle with this one. I, I am a walking Irish stereotype when it comes to this one. Um, and there are, there are plenty of people who are, who are up on the drugs too. All, all the, the drugs that the kids do. Um, the, the, some of us are pretty dense at this lesson. Um, but you'll find the hard limits of synthetic happiness as you keep going. You'll find it. Yeah, it's, it's just a drink, bro. Three bottles in. It's just a DUI, bro. It's no big deal. It's just a job. I don't need that. 
it's just a relationship. I'll find another one before you know it. Eh, it's just a body. Who cares? And so you're, you're rationalizing the synthetic happiness. And at some point, you, wherever your threshold is, you will find it or you die. You know, that, that's about the only options you got here. Uh, you, will, you will end up like this person eventually when you, when, you play this, when you play this game. Now, whether it sticks or not, how many times you have to visit here, I don't know. Uh, that, that's, that's our own individual journey, our own individual stubbornness. Uh, we'll find it. Uh, I might find it one day. We'll see. But the, the benefit here is once you, find the hard, once you find the hard limits of synthetic happiness, it will never tempt you again because you'll have too many memories and you'll have too many experiences. You will never be able to be put on that track again. There was just too much sadness and too much pain behind that. Your neural system will literally not even allow you to do it again. You would rather die. Okay, so now take all these opportunities and what can we do with them? What we're doing is we're training ourselves to actually engage in resisting a neuromyth so that we can say, wait a second, this neuromyth is fucking us up. I want to change this because I am a human and I don't want to live under the confines of a neuromyth. So they want to call you a monster. They're going to call you a monster no matter what you do. There's no diplomatic way around that. There's no personality or celebrity or combination of words that'll magically make this, this, the state uh, that'll make the law and the science uh, ignore you. It's just never going to happen. They are, they only know how to call you monsters. So they only know how to create monsters. Okay. So now that you've mastered all of these opportunities, all of these lashings that they gave you, these opportunities you've done, what you've actually done is you've changed the calculus of your own value in doing so. Meaning, when the science and the law team up because they're married at the hip and they say, it's time to find more monsters, who's to blame? Well, you're suddenly too expensive to target because the shit doesn't work on you anymore. The number one thing that they can take away from you is other people. But if you learn to survive without them, they can't hit you anymore. There's nothing they can hit you with anymore. Now, all of a sudden, these people who are waiting for the green light, these people who drove you into that isolation, they become the cheaper target they become much easier to hit. And so what does the science and the law do? Well, they get the helicopter ride, boys. And you, all of a sudden, you become a cash sink because you're so expensive to target, they throw money at you and they lose money. It's a losing bet for them. And that's why you would go down this path. Because if you don't, you're going to actually feel the isolation and you're going to fall into this state and you're going to fall into whatever this marriage is trying to make you fall into. And maybe you like that. There's a whole army of people who have no problem with this arrangement. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe I'm just an asshole for too long. I'll accept that, right? But sometimes these guys get it wrong. And when the neuromyth is wrong, we've seen what happens when the neuromyth is wrong. We've seen what the dolphin did. The dolphin was pretty angry, right? A dolphin hortler, right? It was a pretty angry fish. I know it's not a fish. The point is we've seen what neuromyths can do when they're bad. So we have a, we have a those of us who understand that, hey, this neuromyth is, is going to end up in a bad spot. Some, I, I suspect a lot of us here may see that. So if you're, going to, if you're going to walk down that road, which I never recommend walking down, but if you find yourself on that road, um, you can take all the punishment that's going to come your way as you walk down that road, and each and every single one of them is an opportunity. And when you're done, when you finally turn all that into an opportunity, you will be a demon hunter. You will learn to hunt demons because these guys, the law is the law and it's going to be what it is. Uh, that it is eternal. There's no way to actually fight the law, but these guys in the old days, we used to call them priests. Now we call them scientists, but these guys are the actual demons, not you. You're not the demon. You're a person. These are the actual demons because they are using their ridiculously bad assumptions to help this thing survive. And maybe this thing tries to survive and it should survive, but the techniques these guys are using are insane, are absolutely, utterly insane. They don't even work. So you turn all these pipe, you turn this pipeline of isolation into a pipeline of opportunity and you will become a demon hunter. Now you might be saying, well, if I think and act and behave like a demon, then what's the difference between demons and myself? It's a fair question. Well, the demons will stop at nothing to destroy you and your world. 
but you will know how to sacrifice everything to save it. And that's how you become a demon hunter. Wow, that was, uh, that was great. Um, can you guys see me? This medium is trying to erase me. I'm the wrong hue for this medium. Um, I'm, I want to encourage you guys to put your, I've seen some good questions. I'll call on you guys soon. Um, I want to remind you to put your questions in the chat and hopefully uh, you have something good. <laughs> I have two questions I just want to, I want to ask. So you spoke about, um, you, you, you referenced this thing called the neuromythology, right? The, uh, I don't know if that's the right term. It's, it seems like you're mentioning this thing, but it's almost like it's, a, it's so amorphous. It's almost like it's trying to engineer precarity in people to make them on the, to keep them on their feet. So is like, I, I, wanna, I want you to talk about that more. Is, there, is it just some type of arbitrary um, kind of symbol hacking into the future or is it there's something more at the core of that? Does that make sense? Uh, are, are you asking what a neuromythology is? Yes. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. So the previous episode went into that. The uh, a neuromythology is just a series of bad analogs we use to explain how our brain works. Um, and we use that uh, to justify morality, legal systems, uh, culture, um, even science at times. So, so however we see the nature of our souls, which is ultimately what neuromythology is trying to figure out anyway, um, uh, that however we define the nature of our souls actually defines the boundaries of what is possible. And eventually when an entire engine and civilization system is built on a single neuromythology, they achieve maximum saturation and then it goes into diminishing returns and then it's just all shit show after that. Uh, so if you need to, if you want to eject from the shit show or you want to turn that shit show into something that was just as orderly as it used to be, um, this whole episode is designed to tell you how to get away from the isolation that will happen to you when you walk down that road and instead turn those into opportunities. Uh, yeah. yeah, I have a question about that isolation. This seems like to be, this seems to be a point at which when you're isolated, you're, you're at risk of falling into a super cult, as you call it in one of your past um, episodes, where, uh, for, take example, the alt-right. I guess a lot of them were isolated individuals and they kind of maybe fell into an, a different cult. I want to know if you have thought about this or and how to kind of stop that from happening to you. Sure. So when a person is isolated, they become desperate for anything that resembles um, the previous social opportunities they had before. So that puts them in a position that there's, they are precarious and they can then be exploited by people who can give the simulation of that social order that they had previously. Um, of course, the science and the law knows that and they intentionally put people in that position. Uh, somehow that's not the discussion that's being made. Somehow it's the discussion that is the cult uh, that they fell into was the problem. Well, maybe if they weren't put in that isolation to begin with, the cult wouldn't have power, uh, but we're not there at that conversation yet. Um, we're still trying to address the symptoms instead of the actual disease itself. Um, so, uh, grr. Um, it's hard for me to entertain the idea that a symptom is, is worth even pursuing, so I might as well just come out and say it. Uh, if you isolate people, if you knowingly isolate people, if you shadow ban them for 12 years, if you cut them off from conversation, if you cut them off from PayPal, you are going to get a backlash that you can't even comprehend. And it's in your best interest to bring them back into the fold sooner rather than later. Um, because this is me being nice. This is me being nice, right? This is, I'm, I'm telling you what these people can do uh, and how this whole thing works and how this whole thing plans out. Um, I, don't, I don't have to be nice. Um, this is just me being nice because I'm, I'm, I'm explaining the last 12 years of the craziness that I was a part of. Um, when these people hit the switch and they go, when they go on, you're not going to turn them off. There is no combination of science or law that's going to turn them off. So I uh, um, 
trying to use AIs to stop hate speech is going to fail miserably because you're not stopping hate speech. You're just stopping the semantic transmission of it. And that's not the same damn thing. That's like saying, I burned the, I, I burned the piece of paper that this law was on, so the law is not in play anymore. It's, it's not how it works. <laughs> just because you wipe out the medium of the semantics doesn't mean that the thoughts aren't still there. Um, so, uh, but this is what happens when, when you isolate people, you got to pay the consequences for it. That's just how it's always been. Yeah, excellent. You, you brought up some personal stuff. I hope we can go over in some future episodes. But I think, uh, Peter, you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Pat, given everything you uh, outlined today, what would be your advice to the STOA? I would uh, not fear isolation. You will be, it, when they're done targeting people like me, they will target you because you will be cheap and I will be too expensive. And when they come for you, just another blip, another, another piece of data science to churn through. So uh, when that time comes, and it will come, um, remember the isolation is the only weapon they have. You now know how to flip it and turn it into an army. So good luck to you. Yes, wow, thank you. Uh, so there's some good questions in the chat. Um, we, I'm gonna ask Dane, if you want to ask your question, I think you were one of the first ones. Someone plus one of you. So. Pat, long time to yep. see. How are oh, you? Oh, man, this guy. Jesus, history, you and I. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shall I go right into my question, or did, did you want to highlight anything from the past? Oh, man. So this guy is the last remnant. Like, you were there when I first uh, started this whole journey, this crazy exploration of how to engage in cyber warfare and how to do meme warfare. And you were there frontline watching the experimental phase. Oh man, I got hit with a couple stray bullets, actually. <laughs> I you remember your Encyclopedia Dramatica page where you called me a castrati. That was nice. Uh, that was, uh... <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I hate to do this to the audience and just go down a personal <laughs> tangent, but I, I've I've been a witness to Pat uh, before he revealed himself as Pat. Um, I mean, we're talking going back as far as eight, 18 years, um, but congrats on this series. It's, it's been fantastic and uh, I'm glad you get to share it with these people who seem very bright. Um, I do have a question for you that is on topic. Um, I wanna know, I've got some notes here because uh, some big ideas, um, but some rebels, um, and if we talk about them in archetypes, there's the wise old rebel who's beloved. There's um, the famous rebel who's still alive. Um, these are people who were never necessarily isolated. I can give some real world examples. Um, Hunter S. Thompson, George Carlin, Terrence McKenna, Timothy Leary. Um, they were always sort of rewarded for their counter neuro myth attitudes. Um, how do you think they fit into your paradigm? And is, is, is it similar to going viral where, well, sometimes you just hit luck and, and you get one of those? Or is there a sort of path and a, and a history that sort of um, builds such a person? Fantastic question. Uh, you'll see in Hollywood that certain celebrities get promoted over others. Now, did they have an it factor? Or were they just part of a really famous family and change their name, like, who's that one singer, Billy Eilish? What's her name, is that her name? Yeah, she's related to all kinds of crazy, powerful Hollywood people. She, she didn't come up through oh, the internet and stuff like that. They just changed her name and voila, look at that. Uh, so, the, if, so the idea of um, the, the rebel being celebrated, uh, you have to ask yourself, um, why is that even being allowed? Is it that the neuromyth of the past is finally allowed to be destroyed? And so that's something else could come and take its place. Uh, the people you cited uh, during uh, the 60s and 70s and 80s, there were tremendous neuromythology dismantling going on. You had decolonization being uh, promoted. You had the re grand return of tabula rasa, the restoration of the neoliberal economic world order from the British. Um, these were monumental geopolitical events. And so the models that they were promoting, they didn't invent. Um, they were tapping into what the world was going to become, which was going to be the, the psychometric liberal capitalism that we have today. 
Um, so that was arguably slated. It's just a question of did the you know finding the per the right personality for the right slot for the right message. Uh, there is an entire team of management for that. Just check out CAA or any type of agency in Hollywood, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, they always try to find these archetypes. Um, so uh, always be mindful about neuromyth destruction as well. And that's a fantastic question because if it's being allowed, um, you also won't be able to stop that. Just like you can't stop the neuromyth. So in the transition from one neuromyth to another, it's just as powerful as the, as the previous neuromyth itself. And you have to, that's a time to critically analyze that transition. Why is it going into here? What is the actual configuration of humanity that is supposed to happen as a result of this? Because if you change neuromyth, you change the configuration. Um, so those are, that's where I would start. I, I would do some analysis on, on why the timing and why the personalities. Thanks for your answer. Thanks to the STOA for your time. Appreciate it. Great question. I just want to plug Pat's VPN. If you guys need to check that out. <laughs> um, so Todd had a question. Todd, would you like to ask your question? Uh, sure. Which one? <laughs> The last one, uh, I'd say, uh, so what, what's the game plan? Do we deconstruct uh, the myths of the deconstructionists? I mean, do we go after their their own system by using their own tools? The way you want to do that is make yourself expensive. That's the first step. You want to make yourself as expensive as possible to target, because cheap targets are the targets that the AIs go for and that the corporations go for. Uh, the targets that are cheap are the, are the targets that you cannot be held accountable for so you can dismiss them. That's why it's very dangerous to be deplatformed because then you become an incredibly cheap target. So it's your responsibility to actually make yourself an expensive hardened target so that when you are hit, there is a reactive chain of events that causes them tremendous amounts of money. Start there if you want to start somewhere. Okay, cool, thanks. Yep. Thanks for the question. Um, next we have Handsome Carl. That's a great image. Yeah. <laughs> Old friends will know. <laughs> um, so I like your strategy. I'm talking about tactics now. Uh, is it possible to disguise an anti-tabula rasa attack under a blue church cause in the interest of asymmetric warfare? Yes, that is, that is feasible. We actually see that every so often come up. It doesn't have a life cycle to where you set it and forget it. It's something you have to curate, and it does mutate as well. Um, there are like the, they take the Karen meme, for example, right? The Karen meme was one of the most beautiful opera, one of the most beautiful modern meme warfare tactics I've seen. And I was out there on, on anybody who has the unfortunate uh, disposition of, of being uh, under the, the withering posts of my Facebook account will know that I was running uh, the Karen meme way before it became what it was. I was out there saying, you know, middle-class white women, this and that, and that, that wasn't, that was me going after the target, not individual middle-class white women. I just saw where the trends were going. And I said, oh man, they're going to slap. And even Dave Chappelle mentioned that in his, um, in one of his uh, previous comedies where he was basically saying, you know, the me too, you know, the, the me too movement, you better enjoy it now because when they turn their hooks on you, they're going to tear you women apart. And Karen's just the beginning. They're going to absolutely slaughter your reputation. Absolutely trash it. Um, the Me Too, they will, the, the people you have pissed off have unlimited accountability, have unlimited un unaccountability and unlimited dollars, and they will trash you. You will see what it's like to be deplatformed, which is why I'm telling you this now. You might not feel it, you might not know it, but it's coming for you. So, um, that type of meme where beforehand you had believe all women and now it's like, well, these women don't even listen to them, effectively deplatform them. And that's how you, you switch the tide so quickly, so fast that they don't even have an understanding of what's going to happen to them. And they're going to feel the isolation and they're not going to be able to explain it. Well, with this video, they'll be able to explain it and they'll know what to do. Excellent, excellent. Um, next, uh, Cooper. Cooper, you have a question? Yeah. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Pat, it's been interesting listening to a couple of your videos, like I, well, a couple, all of the videos and all the, the posts online. 
So I, I, I respect your viewpoint on many things. Uh, one would be your, your end goal is get to the stars. And in previous videos, it was, why don't we have these specific like scientific questions answered? Do you think that getting to the stars as that next step solves it, like, eventually gets us to solve the problem of dark matter, et cetera? Uh, second question, do you think that like a equivalent of a tattooing like cantina exists on some faraway galaxy where there are you know other people who have made it to the stars conversing? Uh, third, I, I respect you because you come from the 4chan, 8chan, like, like behind the scenes clusterfuck of people who know what they're doing online. And I would just like to hear you rant about applicable, anonymous security while posting certain things, you know, whatever, whatever that means to you. Uh, and then... I don't know. Fourth, uh, good, good shit, man. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed it. Okay, um, uh, I'll I will go through those three questions. First one, stars. Uh, getting to the stars is not a science problem. The reason I am attacking science and abandoning it so heavily is because I realize it is not a science problem. Solving uh, dark matter and solving quantum gravity will not get us into the stars. I know that's the great promise everybody has, and I used to subscribe, subscribe to it too. Getting to the stars is not a science problem. You cannot hire enough nerds. Like You could put a gun to every human being alive and say, you are now a scientist or I will shoot you, and you will still not get to the stars. The problem is that there is no reason to go to the stars because space is a desert, and capitalism sucks at deserts unless it has a bunch of oil under it. Otherwise, you don't go into a desert. So there's no profit motive to go conquer a desert. It's too damn expensive. And Biosphere 2 is hilarious. Check out Steve Bannon's involvement in that. It's amazing. Um, now, the other part about the stars is that it, because it is not a science problem, then what type of problem is it? It is an economics problem. It is, in, it is a question of incentives. It is a question of alchemy more than anything else. You have to find the right alchemical transmutation chains to trick all of humanity into going into a desert. Because there's only two ways to actually maintain a desert, uh, to conquer a desert. You either trick people into doing it, which Alexander did, or you use religion. Religion can also conquer deserts. But those are the only two things that have done it in mankind. So capitalism won't do it. Communism won't do it. Um, you either need religion or you need to like pull like an epistemic emperor a la Alexander to pull it off. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm this, that's a running theme in everything I'm doing in, in this season. And now regarding previous cognition, a, uh, a Tatooine type of thing, um, who's to say we're the only sentients who have ever evolved on this planet? Biology's had a long run here. Who knows what dinosaurs became? Maybe there's a Saro sapien that appeared at some point and just kind of left and said, peace out. You know, there's a lot of opportunities when you're, when you're playing with neurology over two billion years. Um, how many times did we leave the planet? It would, be, it, would, it would suck if the answer was greater than one and we didn't do it. That would be very embarrassing. What would the kids think of us? Um, and then finally, the, the HN rant about security. I used to do security forever and it just, it bought me time, but it does, eventually you run out of time. So security, <sighs> you practice your OPSEC correctly. You practice being anonymous. If you are engaging in a high risk, high penalty content, um, that's not to say illegal. If it's illegal, you shouldn't be fucking doing it. Um, but if you're, if you're talking high social damage content that is legal, um, then obviously OPSEC is important and you should be doing the basics. Uh, you should have a false identity, meaning not a fake identity, but a false one, meaning when people dox you, they actually dox a social justice warrior instead. Ah, now that's interesting. People don't tell you that because it's not like those people actually do their due diligence and say, oh, well, uh, that's one of us, so we shouldn't attack them. They don't know that. They'll tear that person's life apart, and then two weeks later, they're really, oh, that was one of our allies, and then they'll be off to the next one anyways. These people don't understand the concept of, of adaptation or you know, apologies or anything like that. They just want meat for the grinder. So make sure that all of your identity points to a social justice warrior so that they tear them apart. Um, and regarding security, the thing about security is that it's something, it is a currency to spend. It is not a currency to hoard. 
most people approach security like it's a hoarding thing, like I need more and more security, I need more and more of it. No, you spend your security to get objectives complete. Just keep that difference in mind um, and you'll understand when to reveal yourself and when to reveal a fake identity and just weigh the costs and the, cost and the benefits. Hey, hey, keep it clean in the chats. Keep it clean in the chats, guys. Um, I really, yeah, I agree with Anjan, the uh, desert. That, that, that analogy is very fascinating. But I want to skip, I want to skip a few people because someone got a plus one. I'll come back. Uh, Mimetic Keeper, you had a question. Yeah, um, you actually just sort of, you gave one answer to it just now, but um, I was going to ask, how can one work on making themselves expensive to target? Right. So um, you can preemptively go down the isolation pathway that I laid out and do all those things in advance. Uh, learn how to identify those who are isolated. Um, all those tricks that I just showed you, preemptively do those, practice yourself with those uh, so that when the time comes, you don't fear isolation. So that what you're doing is you're preemptively making yourself expensive. I, I guess the, like I know, um if you're already capable of withstanding isolation, I know that's a kind of expensive, but I guess I was thinking like more of a retaliatory thing or, um, or I don't know. Yeah, reactive. Like, yeah. Cause, cause you know, you can kind of go and be isolated and be a monk on a hill for a long time, but it's- No, like, that's not what I mean. That's not what you mean. Okay. No, no, that's, that's a mythology. That's a neuro myth you have to get rid of as well. I don't mean isolation in terms of seeking enlightenment. I mean, isolation purely as an economic cost strategy. Uh, think, um, the idea is, is to, when you are isolated, the, the cost of attacking you is, is negligible. And so you're opening, you're actually inviting yourself for more attack when you are isolated, which is why they isolate you. It's the setup, it's the first round. Uh, then they hit you with the, with, the, with the big boys and the shooty boys, and then uh, they shoot everyone just like you. And all of a sudden there wasn't a genocide. What are you talking about, you conspiracy theorist? That was 800,000 people didn't die. That's crazy. Pff, I'm just going to listen to this new song now. Um, so that's why you don't want to isolate yourself. Uh, when I say um, uh, prepare for isolation, I don't mean like get used to being alone. Nobody can actually get used to being alone. It's a state that we, re 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 we resist being alone. Uh, usually we are forced into being alone because things either get too complicated, we need a cooling off period, or we just walked into a situation incorrectly to begin with. Um, what I'm saying is preemptively do the, the six things that I walked through this video. And you won't be preparing yourself for isolation if you do those six things. What you'll be doing is you'll be preparing yourself for reaction to when you are isolated. And these are two different things. All right, thanks. Uh, Pat, I want to be mindful of your time. Um, sure. We have a couple more questions. How many more do you want to, want to take? Just keep them coming. I was pretty fiery today at the end, so I'm sure a lot of people have questions. All right, we have four more questions. Let's, let's leave it at that now. Um, Andrew. Hi. Uh, I have a, can you explain uh, uh, heritocracy? Like, was that a pun or like? Yeah. I was so con I was so confused by that. Like I just thought yeah. it was like a like a reward or punishment system. Sure, it's um it's a uh, it's it's me being uh, punny about a, a libertarian meme where uh, helicopter rides are a libertarian meme where um I forget uh, Pinochet Pinochet would throw communists and socialists out out of helicopters. So that's a that's a running meme in the libertarian community where uh, if you are a socialist you get free helicopter rides. Um, and then the helicopter cash is a, another libertarian meme where um, uh, when the bailouts happened, it was the equivalent of Ben Bernanke sitting in a helicopter throwing money outside of the helicopter, just ridiculously raining cash all over the place. Um, so the idea of these two things being the only way that the science and the law can respond, they can either pay you more and more money or they can beat you more and more. Um, that's, the, that's the heliocracy. It's, the helicopter is a, a central part of that. So it's, it's just a it's a punny play on libertarian meme ecosystems. Oh, okay, thank you. And, and then I had, a, I had a, 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 another question on, on top of that. Like, what's like when you talk about like going to isolation? Is that kind of like is that kind of like the hero's journey if you're preparing for isolation? And kind is that kind of like that where you're built where you're you are alone, so you figure out what your allies are, and then you. Like, is that, is that what, 
um, Joseph Campbell was talking about, like in the heroes, are you kind of like, is that parallel? To that's a, that's to a pretty good parallel. About? I think that's a really good analog. That's really uh, perceptive of you. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, it is, it is a, a domain specific version of the hero's journey for sure. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Great questions. I can't believe I missed Megan, one of my favorite people in the store. Megan, I missed your question. Could you want to ask it? Oh, thanks. Um, thanks, Pat, for putting all these together. This is great. Um, this is the first one I've been able to get to um, for real. Um, um, two weeks ago, you were talking about Emblem uh, 21 um, and what the what the steps of that mean. Um, and I've never I've never seen it quite like that. Um, I but I suspect you're right. Um, but I also think what you're describing is the thing that I would call um, negative path ascension. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of effort went into convincing all of us that negative path ascension is the only option, right? You know, get off this rock before we blow it up. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think there is, there is an alternative. I might not be able to explain it, but I feel like I kind of have to have a go. <laughs> um, when you were uh, so when you were describing it, you were using uh, using uh, like control and mastery of all of these steps. So you take your human relations and you control them, and your economy and you control it, and your elements and you control them. Um, and that dynamic is what makes it negative path. Um, but like today at the end of the session, uh, you were saying, um, you know, what makes us different from the demons is, um, well, we we have power, um, but we're using it to you know save humanity, not not destroy it. And to do that in a way that's not using that negative path dynamic of control is, um, I, I don't have the language for it, but it's, um, it's knowledge. Um, it's like uh, recognizing and integrating human relations, uh, either like the, the internal, you know, male, female aspects of nature. And then the same for every single step. Um, I think that's the best I can do at explaining that. I just, I, I felt like I had to have a go at mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. that alternative. There, there is, um... And, and thank you for that. There is a, a limitless number of people who will challenge my language. There are more people who will challenge my language than there are people. Um, that, that's usually how it goes. And um, the idea that uh, one way or the other way is the only way, I don't play that game. But what I'm doing is I'm saying, if you find yourself in the road that I am in, and if you find yourself in the perspective that's I am, that I'm in and you did not see the results of all the other ways, what I'm proposing will work. There will be costs. There will be penalties. I'm not promising an easy ride. I'm not promising a, a, a risk-free ride. I'm saying this will work. You will pay for it, but this will work. All the other roads are like, well, we can minimize our costs and we can minimize our gains and you rationalize it. And that's fine. There's a place for that. There is a place for that type of optimization. Um, but if, if you see an eminent threat at the existential level and you don't have a solution, mm, I would put all solutions on the table and then kind of pick from them. And so I'm just trying to be another utensil in the drawer. That sounds like a very um, good food for thought. Um, so yeah, we're, we're kind of running out of time. I think we should do one more question and then Key's question. <laughs> Um, Sorry, Key. So, Anjan, Anjan, you heard a question. Um, hey, Pat, I'll yeah, read out my question. Um, so, it seems like one way to operationalize these ideas is to find that, find your army um, as soon as possible. Well, what do you think are the best ways to do that? What are some of the mediums and channels, communities? And then who do you reckon you target first with your efforts? Sure. Um, the, the, you, want, you want to refer to the, the alchemical cognition uh, slide or video again, bec uh, because, again, because uh, what I'm doing is I'm recognizing the limitations that every brain has, three pounds of meat, neuron stuff, and all the other limitations we have. You can't appeal to everyone. The desire is to appeal to everybody because we live in a society. We live in a society. Eh, that's an old meme. I get it. Um, but we are conditioned via mass media to be in this eternal state of childlike thinking. 
Now, that's not to say we're not smart. That's not to say we're not intelligent. Children can be very intelligent. Um, but it's the idea of trying to find the maximum amount of reward for the least amount of accountability. That's child thinking. So um, by being in that state, the easiest way to maximize the amount of reward while minimizing accountability is try to appeal to as many people as possible. You end up in this weird social, uh, this social network hedge where you're trying to say, oh, but I don't, I don't want to isolate anybody because er that one node could be the one, you know, six degrees of separation. This one person might know the billionaire I need or this one person might be the account that I need and you play these games. And so you end up bending over backwards for every single person you ever meet uh, until you gradually lose your fucking mind. So instead of playing that game, um, uh, I would consider recognizing what it is your biases are. What is your personality? What is it? What are your preferences? Are you honest about your preferences? Uh, are you because you are accountable for your preferences, whether you know it or not? We're always accountable for our preferences, uh, whether we can define it or not. So you, or the only thing you have to ask yourself is, are you honest about them? Because once you're honest about your preferences, then the accounting isn't so hard. And so once you know what your preferences are, you know what you're attracting. Because what you put out is what you get back. What you put out is a, is, a, is a criteria for a filter. If I was to wear a very bright colored shirt instead of my normal dark garb, and if I had a funny little hat on, and I was making clown noises every so often, I'd probably attract crowds of people and trained animals and peanuts. right? So how, what, I, what I put out is, is what's going to come back to me. Um, as long as you're honest about what you're accountable for and honest about your preferences, that's what you're putting out anyway. That's what people are picking up. I'm sure we have like this veneer and we have these, uh, you know, these behavioral tricks and, and these fun little games we like to play all the time, but people are pretty good at actually getting to the core of a person. Uh, if, if they don't see the core of a person, it's because they're suspending the disbelief. So do you want people to be in that perpetual system of disbelief as you go about your life? Some people are okay at that. Um, but in terms of trying to build that army and find that army, Take accountability of your preferences, attract the people who are okay with that accountability, and that's your inner circle. Filter for that. Build the strong relationships, test those relationships, el eliminate the relationships that can't hold and endure. As you trial and error and trial and error and trial and error, you're going to get that core team of people that you can then build from. Because as you move forward with the, the purpose of an army is, is, is not just military, it's not just martial. Uh, the purpose of an army is to affect change effectively that's the point you can't do it yourself you're not rambo you're not you're not the superhero the world was waiting for no one is uh you need people to change people so change even then the word change offends me greatly and i'm not offended by much a change implies tabula rasa like oh you're not you're not thinking right i need to change you right and for some people that's that's their mission in the world um but but if you want to have an impact in a meaningful way or you have something you want to get done build your core team by holding your preferences uh, or be honest about your preferences because that's what you're going to attract anyway, whether you know it or not. And that's all you're going to have to work with because you're not going to be there in front of every single part of your team and network and say, I'm going to micromanage you and blah, 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 blah. And I have the technology to do so. You got to learn to trust your teammates because you have to. That's why you have a team to begin with. So I would start there. That's excellent. Excellent. This is exactly what we need. Um, you know, I feel bad for Key because we no, keep pressuring no. her to uh, feel bad. <laughs> bring us home. Key abuse. <laughs> I, I, home I need to have a chat with Key to make sure that this is not no, some no, type no, no. of you're, you're... Key, do you have a question? Key, what's your question? Hey. Wow. Hi. Thank you. As I always say, I guess, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to say at this point. Thanks for saying that you want to have a talker. And also appreciating the way in which this presentation was formatted. Yeah, I said in the chat that you're not a utensil, and yet I tend to speak in ways that I try to get to the most efficient way of like describing what I'm thinking. Um, so I'm just gonna scroll up so I remember what happened in the moment <laughs> as I asked the question. Um, because I was responding to what Megan um, had said and um, it was helpful for me to see um, that way of thinking. So the question was about the, but you kind of answered the question already uh, in the last bit. Um, 
I, I just said, tactics of being a demon hunter in your view. And then um, if you could maybe go on, I also am asking for a rant. Wow, okay. Um, about the short form story uh, of the 20 years. Um, I understand, I, I'm really glad that you said this whole like child perspective piece thing. Um, I'm, you know, like the uh, maximum reward and minimal accountability. I'm not, that's not, you know, like I understand that that's um, a worry. Uh, I, I do want to be accountable for the things that I do and say and think. Um, so with that said, yeah, I'd love to hear your story. Usually I can track key. I do my best to track. I couldn't find the question. I found one question. Was there another one? Can't, that's the question. The tactics of being a human ah, hunter. Right. Yes. And then yes. it was like, can you talk about your story? If not, no oh, problem. Oh, oh, I see. I see. I'm sorry. Um, it's okay. Yeah. No, I'm uh, sorry too for not being <laughs> clear enough. Uh, uh, tactics of being a demon hunter. Um, you have to think like a demon without becoming one. That's where people fuck it up. They fuck it up so hard there. Um, because the moment you think like a demon, you can rationalize. Like when, once you start rationalizing stuff, it just never ends. I mean, it, the rationalization is the worst thing you could possibly do. Uh, you, he, you see those types of arguments all the time online where someone's like, uh, I make this proposition. And then someone comes in and says, oh, well, this proposition is wrong for X, Y, Z reasons. And then, then the person who initially come in and said, ah, I was intentionally being wrong. That's what, shut up. No, you weren't. <laughs> that's, a, that's a rationalization. Give me a break. Um, so people can rationalize anything that, that, that our if we could just like turn rationalization into like energy, uh, we wouldn't even need nuclear power. We'd be set. Um, so we're very good at lying to ourselves in the, in the sense that we lie to ourselves to save face. And that's, that's what anti accountability is. And we've been on that track since the boomers. Um, and yeah, I said it, fight me. Um, but yeah, we've been on track since the boomers. Uh, to have that anti-accountability uh, culture and theme. So um, the key with being a demon hunter is you have to think, breathe, react, act, and be a demon. And it's hard because uh, those actions will lead you into isolation. Um, and it's not for everybody. Uh, this is not something that can be industrially scaled out. This is for people who have already been hit by the, the science and the law and, and, the, and the Cthulhu-like impossibility of describing it. Uh, people who've already been isolated, people who've already lost stuff, people who've already had things seized from them, uh, people who have lost loved ones, the, the pain in the world that's very real and there is no network out there for them. I'm not out here on a Jesus mission. Maybe the AIs are, but I'm a human and I'm, and I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm not a goddamn saint. I, I just know what works and what doesn't in these types of fights. And uh, when you have that type of loss, um, we are very good at ignoring the other person who went through it. Uh, so remember the self-isolation is part of that pipeline of why resisting sucks. The self-isolation is where you, you don't understand what happened to you. And so you lash out trying to find someone to explain it to you, but they don't understand it either. And they think you're crazy. Uh, so they push, them, they push you away. Um, that is, that is where things go off the rails and you start coming up with very strange rationalizations about what happened to you and what's going on. And that's what can make you look like a demon. Uh, but what I'm saying in here is, is to not just reactively get yourself into that demonic state. I'm saying consciously do it so that when you are put into it, you know how to pull yourself out. That's the key. Because if you do not do that, when you are put in that state, you will become the monster that will then justify the law and the science, because that's what they need. They need that justification to, to prop up their system and prop up everything they do. That's why they punished you to begin with, so that you could be the scapegoat. So consciously put yourself in that demonic space so that when you are put in that position, you are already prepared to pull yourself out. Because um, if you don't do that, you're going to be on for a hell of a ride in that isolation. And those synthetic happiness pills are going to fuck you up for a long time. Um, now, that said, uh, my life story is, you can imagine, I've, if I'm able to talk about this stuff with a somewhat straight face and a smile, I, I'm quite acquainted with actual living demons. Uh, I know people who have killed people. So I, like, 
I've known people who've killed people since I was a teenager, right? So it's, it's like, I understand the full spectrum of human potential and I've known it for my entire life. Um, and it never goes away. Once you really see the full human spectrum, you see it everywhere. Um, and that's not, that's not a cognitive bias. Um, the, the tabula rasa says human potential is the most important thing. We write our stories. Well, human potential goes all over the place. It's not always the good stuff. It's the bad stuff too. The potential to be absolutely heinous is just as infinite as being absolutely progressive. It's just as infinite. So I, I got to see all of it. So um, I, I would, when I was younger, I used to be much more open about it because that was my strategy to try and win pity points. I don't do that anymore. So uh, I'm happy to take that particular question one-on-one -on -one if you'd like. Oh, wow. Oof. I think, you know, I kind of liked that it was getting personal. Maybe we can do that some other time. Um, but yeah, I, re I really like this idea of, you know, keeping track of your s the stories that you're telling yourself and consciously putting them down and entering that liminal isolated state consciously. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to uh, let other people ask their questions. I know there's two more, but Peter just wants to, we have to close this down and Peter wants to plug in some other story events. So Peter. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Khalil. Thank you, Pat. Another uh, dark stoa. Um, so upcoming events at the stoa. We have a few events this Sunday, mimetic mediation, 3.30 PM Eastern time on Sunday. Uh, and uh, the sexy Armenian Daniel Kazanjian is back uh, with his metagame mastermind that's at 6 p.m. Eastern time uh, on Sunday. And then uh, our uh, meta modern sex columnist, maybe Gray, is doing a sacred sex session or her raw sexuality series on sacred sex. And, and uh, Toronto based graphic novelist Chester Brown is going to uh, discuss sacred role of sexual transgression and prostitution in Christianity and explore God's rule for rule breakers. So uh, check that out. You can go to stoa.ca. Um, and the stoa is based off of a gift economy. Uh, if you want a gift to pat directly, go to the stoa.ca slash gift. And then you can see the sexy or handsome and sexy illustration of, of Pat Ryan and go to that. And then you can uh, gift to him there directly. Excellent. Thank you again, Pat. I think I speak for everyone by saying that, you know, it's an absolute gift. And yeah, thanks. I hope to see you again next week. See you folks. Have a good one. Thanks everyone.